Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm sorry for the delay this week. Long story short, I'm having my house re-roofed. And so, hold on, so, well, I had to put it off because otherwise you'd be hearing, well, you know, Greek, 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 All out in this background noise through all this, so, now at long last, I have an opportunity to relax and talk to you about a film that came out recently. On the minus side, the reason I get to talk and relax and talk to you about this is because the, well, it's over a hundred degrees outside in Oregon. What is wrong with the world where it is a hundred degrees in freaking Oregon? <sighs> anyway. So, this week I'm here to talk to you about a movie that was released recently. And that is Batman, the new Batman film, The Dark Knight Rises. And I totally flubbed that introduction there, but that's okay. I'm just going to roll with it because failed melodrama is kind of a thing. I'll take a sip from my refreshing glass of ice water because it's so gore I'm hot. And talk to you about the film. In short, without getting too much of spoilers, Dark Knight Rises is basically the story of Batman sort of getting it, getting the other tiger back. It just getting things where it's been used in reviews elsewhere that are non-spoilerific, and see the trailer. Batman has kind of been out of action for several years um, as of the start of the film. And Bruce Wayne has become something of a recluse. Um, however, when Bane, a mysterious mercenary who has tie appears to have ties to the League of Shadows, starts getting involved in Gotham, it's up to the Bat to come and save him from... to save the city and defeat his evil, malicious plan. Now, if you're familiar with the Batman universe and the Batman comics, you kind of have an idea where this is going in terms of what stories this is cribbing from. The trailers kind of make it clear it's taking cues from No Man's Land with the destruction of the bridges into Gotham and sort of stuff with Gotham City being cut off from the rest of the world. And, of course, with Bane, Nightfall. Perhaps, I'm not going to say the greatest Batman storyline ever, um, but it is one of the most famous. And I, and I don't know if I call it the best Bane storyline, because Gail Desmond did some excellent work with the character in Secret Six, but it's definitely a storyline which really did a good job of setting him up as a threat and making him a real menace to Batman and to Gotham and making him a real valuable member of the Rogues Gallery in terms of a, a villain who's a real, who's strong, but intelligent and also a threat. And who is not necessarily, you know, absolutely stark raving mad, as, you know, well, the Joker, Poison Ivy, Scarecrow, you know, every, like everyone else in his Rogues Gallery. Save the Penguin, and even that's questionable. So there's that. Um... It's a good movie. I have to say this. I cannot not deny that this is a very, very good film. Um, Christopher Nolan's Bat Trilogy now has become, honestly, one of the best series of superhero films of all time. Which is saying a lot, because I mean, a lot of the other series of superhero films have been incredibly uneven. Um, Spider-Man 1 and 2 were okay... But then we got Spider-Man three, and that was that was horrible. Same with X-Men one and two. They hit the first two films were good. One was okay. Two was great, and then three was terrible. Um, we then had um, these. Oh, 
the Superman films, which are like one one was good, two was great, and then everything after that was kind of all over the map. Well, generally on the, the dire side of the map, but they're kind of varying levels of bad. Uh, and then the earlier Batman films. So with these superhero films, it's really it's a good sign. It really shows that modern directors and writers are finally getting superheroes. I mean, between the Bat series and between the Marvel films, honestly, I think this is some um, really a sign of hopefully good things to come, particularly with, with the upcoming release of Superman, um, Man of Steel is actually the, the official title, which is while it's being directed by Zack Snyder, the trailer, which was shown before the film, had Chris Nolan's fingerprints all over this. Again, a good sign. Um, that said, as far as how does it stack up to the two earlier films, I would say, this is hard to pick, but I would say this would be kind of equivalent to... It's not as good as Dark as uh, The Dark Knight, but I think it's a little better than Batman Begins. Batman Begins found itself to a certain degree tied to the baggage of having to retell the Batman backstory and quickly get the origin story done and all this other stuff. Whereas this film handles things a lot better um, in terms of it, it's like the Dark Knight, like, like the Dark Knight, it's able to tell its story without having to retread anything to get us involved. But it doesn't have the well, it doesn't have the fact of with the Dark Knight, you had Heath Ledger as the Joker, as frankly the greatest Joker since Mark Hamill. So we've got that. But, all of that said, I mean, this, it's a good film, I liked it, but there is one thing which bugs me about this movie, and it relates to the script. Um, one of the things that's been brought up, it's a little bit in the trailers, it's also brought up a lot in the reviews, is Bane in the movie, when he takes over Gotham. He basically, not explicitly, but implicitly ties himself into the Occupy 99% movement. And the, the way it's done, it's kind of clear that the villain is not actually endorsing this movement. He's not part of this movement. He's using it as trappings to justify his actions in the same way that when you see a country describe itself as the Democratic People's Republic of anywhere, you can be reasonably certain that it is none of those things. Aside from the anywhere part. In terms of, it is at that location. Sort of, unless it's like Holy Roman Empire. But I'm digressing. Um, the point is, the way I bring that up is one of the screenwriters on this film, one of the people who worked on the story, is David S. Goyer. And Goyer is also working on the story for the new Call of Duty game. Um, I forget the sequel to Black Ops. Black Ops 2, I don't know what subtitle is. And in that game, the villain is also tied to the 99% movement. And the game promotional materials have, you know... Um, G. Gordon Libby in there, who I believe was described by Mark Slackmeyer in Doonesbury in terms of his role in the Watergate trial and attempting Watergate scandal, attempting to bug the Democratic Party's offices and generally do dirty tricks and negatively affect the flow and acts of democracy as being, <clears throat> and I quote, guilty, 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 guilty. I believe is the expression Slackmire used. And so it, it, all these things kind of coincide together to kind of make me wonder 
is David S. Goyer getting a case of the brain eater? For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, the brain eater comes from science fiction fandom, and it's and used to describe science fiction writers. When a writer of science fiction reaches a level of clout and, and reputation where basically he no longer needs an editor, or at least he can he can overrule his editors, and thus can use this to perhaps have certain traits which maybe are new to his stories, or maybe existed before but were kept downplayed, uh, and forced them to the forefront in an unpleasant fashion, that is when it outright has the brain eater. Some really good examples of this. Um, one of the classic examples is writer Piers Anthony, of the creator of the Xanth series. In his Xanth series, there was this little undercurrent of characters who are under legal age, who are depicted in a somewhat sexual fashion. Let's just say that. And in his work, it's... I'm not going to say he plays it innocent, but it's played he kept subtle and on the down low early in his career. Later on, though, we had... It, 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 his affinity for that, just put it that way, got way too much in the forefront. Um, it got more in some of his stories outside of the Xanth series. I forget the name of the series, but there was a science fiction series he wrote which had a female main character who was like 13 or 14 getting in a consensual relationship with a space pirate, with a significantly older space pirate, involving sexual intercourse and bondage. Yeah, you go, Piers Anthony. Um, similarly, there was, um, well, there, to a certain degree, Harbert Heinlein was described as having this with stuff like um, group marriages and that sort of stuff in some of his later books. But perhaps the most infamous example is the creator of Cerberus, the comic book Cerberus the Art Bar, the comic book series, Dave Sim, who, I don't know if it's depression combined with a bad breakup or divorce or whatever, but basically the last few, last portion of his Swords and Sorcery series, where they kind of played straight, but then said, going more to send up and commentary on, on the type, on the genre, just went straight to this bizarre direction of come of pseudo Christianity combined with um, a bizarre kind of misogyny, describing women as voids which consume all of the light which which is emanated from men and all this. It was weird. It, it was unpleasant to read. If you really want to get into this, look for the later volumes of Cerberus the Aardvark, but in the case of David S. Goyer, in this case, it's leaning more toward the realm of Goyer getting really conservative in unpleasant fashions, in terms of attacking the 19... the... his attacks against the, 19, the Occupy movement. Um, he has not gotten into the level of racism particularly Islamophobia, that, say, writers like Dave, like Dan Simmons of the, uh, who created the Hyperion Cantos did. But he's still got problems. And we'll have to see when he writes more stuff, the more stuff he writes, to see where he goes with this. Uh, particularly places where he has more control of his own material, like with um, Black Ops 2. So, let's we'll see how that goes. But, fortunately, he's kept in check here. He hasn't and is, in a certain way, an editor in the form of the Nolan brothers, Christopher and Jonathan Nolan. And so what I, what I think could have ended up overpowering the story is kept very much in check, thank God. But it's something that is there, and you cannot avoid it when you see this movie, unfortunately. Um, it is in your face enough that it took me out of the movie and had me sitting there in the theater going, really? Really, we're going there? Do we have to? Do we need to? Does this serve the plot of the story at all? 
could this portion of the story be excised entirely without, you know, hurting the story? And the answer is yes. So, I don't know. Do I recommend you see this film? Yes. I mean, honestly, admittedly, by now, if you're going to see this movie, you have probably decided whether or not you're going to go see it or not. It's been out for two weeks. So, admittedly, if I'd gotten this video out earlier, maybe I might, I might have been more able to sway you in the direction of going to see it. Oh, there is one th way I might be able to sway you more. I give this film my newly created award of the... Oh... The Battle of Hoth Memorial Award for Memorial Award for Films to See on a Hot Day. Because a large chunk of the conclusion of this film is set in Gotham City in the winter time. It is 103 degrees outside right now. And you know, it's right on DVD or Blu-ray. I'd be marathoning this Empire Strikes Back and Dr. Zhivago. Possibly also John Carpenter's The Thing and 30 Days of Night. Because right now it is way hotter than it needs to be. And I'd like to feel cooler. Thank you very much. With that said, next week I am going to review another video game as I take a look at the final chapter of the Call of Duty Modern Warfare franchise in Modern Warfare 3. And to talk a bit about the story, I'm not going to do a full narrative breakdown, but I will go into detail of the problems I have with that story's, well, narrative. It's plot holes and issues and things. So until next time, I'm Count Zero. Thank you for watching.